Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mushrooming Basics with Melina Kozanitis. This is the 15th of 17 programs in SSU's Dig Into Nature Fall 2021 series. My name is Margot Rollins, and I'm a program coordinator at SSU Center for Environmental Inquiry, and I'll be your host today. So let me know via the chat if there's anything you need. Can everyone also please take a minute now to type their full name into the chat box. This is our sign in sheet. Thanks for doing that. Before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about the center. We are here to empower students of all ages and disciplines to solve the environmental challenges of the North Bay, in effect, to turn education into action. We provide direct outdoor learning experiences on our three preserves. We have Fairfield Osborne on Sonoma Mountain in Rohnert Park the Galbraith Wildlands Preserve in Southern Mendocino County and Los Gilicos in Kenwood. We provide classes, workshops, and tours that focus on experiential learning and skill building. Additionally, we make the SSU preserves open to anyone interested in education, research, or creative inquiry. We acknowledge, honor, and make visible that these lands are the ancestral lands of native peoples. We invest in real world projects, working with faculty, community, and students across all disciplines to develop projects focused on finding solutions to North Bay environmental challenges. We create long-term multi-organizational partnerships that generate the resources and funding needed to chip away at complex issues surrounding water fire technology and other topics. We invite you all to join our diverse community of learners and problem solvers, no matter what background or education or connection you might have to the university. We welcome everyone from all parts of society, recognizing that we all need to work together if we're going to be successful. There are many ways you can get involved. You can engage in research, take our naturalist or land management training programs, access data, lead events like these, partner with us on projects, or help create more programs like this by donating, since all of our work here is funded by the generous support of donors. And do come on our Saturday hikes on Osborne Preserve. We are doing those in real life, and we invite you to join us. Today, we're going to be focusing on mycology and the basic knowledge and skills you need to go out into the woods and identify the various species of mushrooms you find. Our presenter is Dr. Melina Kazanitas, a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley in the Ackerley Lab. She's also a guest lecturer on mycology and plant biology at SSU. Melina has been working on our preserves for about four years, recording the species of mushrooms found and looking at some of the changes over those years. If you have clarifying questions as we go along, please put them in the chat and I will relay them to her. I'm going to monitor that on her, on her behalf. Uh, we've scheduled time for question and answers at the end of the hour, and Melina and I will stay on Zoom for a while if you have more questions. You can also feel free to email me after the event for any follow-up questions. I'm putting my email in the chat, and it's the same address that you received. Um, getting it in the chat. Maybe I'm not getting it in the chat. Excuse me for a minute here. Um, so we will be recording this session and I will be in touch with all of you when it has been posted on our website. You will be able to find it at sonoma.cei.sonoma edu slash calendar slash past. And I will also put that in the chat. So with that, Melina, it's all yours. Great, thank you. So um, today I have been asked to give you all a little bit of an overview of how to go about collecting, identifying your own uh, mushrooms uh, that you might find out in the world when you're walking through the woods. We are in prime mushroom season right now. And so 
even when the rain is slow, which luckily it hasn't been this fall, but sometimes it's very slow to arrive. There's still mushrooms to be found out there. And um, if you are wanting to improve your skills in identifying mushrooms, there's always mushrooms out there to start with. So all you have to do is just kind of shift your focus to the ground. And sometimes they can be a lot smaller than you think. And uh, there's always material for you to practice with, um, even in the dry summer, you can find them on well-watered lawns or on decaying wood. So we're lucky this season, we had some early rains and the mushrooms are uh, fruiting like crazy right now. So it's a good, good season to be interested um, or to start your skills, building your skills. Uh, if any of you already have some mushroom identification skills or have been out collecting, I apologize for anything that is repetitive. This is kind of a uh, very beginner uh, guide to identification and uh, collection. So you can just space out and look at the pictures or um, I don't know. I hope that it's not too repetitive for you. So it's hard to jump in and just talk about collecting mushrooms without talking about, you know, a little background, what they are. So I'm going to give a really rapid kind of overview of fungi and where mushrooms fit into that. And um, I'm going to go faster than I want to because I have like a hundred hidden slides in here that I could tell you all about. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on the um, the things that were, you know, specifically advertised for this talk. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a moment to get started. Um, I don't think you can see that yet. No? And somebody, I'm getting some background info on. So uh, make sure you're muted if you don't mind. Some background sound. Okay, here we go. So can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yeah? Great, okay, I'm getting a thumbs up. Yes, we can. All right, thank you. So today I'm gonna to give you a brief outline of what we're gonna be talking about and I'm gonna try and stay on task. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the different lifestyles of fungi. So basically, um, where they're growing, how they're eating, and that's what we mean when we say a lifestyle. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the life cycle of mushrooms themselves and the parts of a mushroom that are going to be helpful for identifying. Uh, I'll go over some supplies for collection if you're out uh, collecting mushrooms for identification. And then I'm going to talk about how to photograph mushrooms for identification because a lot of people are... Um, using online resources to upload photos that they take, hoping that experts will be able to help them identify them. And having a good photograph is gonna be key to getting an identification on your unknown species. And then I'll go over some of the web resources out there that can help you try to figure out what you have. And iNaturalist, uh, which is a great place where you can post your photos and then um, hopefully get an expert to ID them for you. Um, I'll go over some guidebooks that I like for the area. And if we have time, I'll go over a few common species in the woods right now that you might see. Okay, so really quickly, just what are fungi? Um, fungi are more similar to animals actually than they are to plants based on their cellular makeup. Um, but they're eukaryotes, in, which is a group that contains plants, animals, and protists, basically things that have a nucleus. So they're not like bacteria or um, archaea that don't have a nucleus. Um, they're usually multicellular with the exception of yeast, which is a, a unicellular fungi. And like I said, they're more commonly related to animals than plants. Um, we, have a, we have a common ancestor that, that we shared about one and a half billion years ago. And that may seem like a long time, but what that means is that we, have more similarities to fungi than we do to plants or that fungi and plants have to each other. 
So the main reason for that, which we'll get into later, and maybe some of you can guess, is because fungi and animals um, are heterotrophs. We eat something other than ourselves, where plants are autotrophs. They generate their own food from the sun. Um, so the main thing that mushrooms do or fungi do when they are eating, which is eating something other than themselves, is that they are the great decomposers. They are breaking vital chemical elements back into the environment into forms that other organisms can use. And they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. We think about fungi, we think about a mushroom, but uh, they can be microscopic, they can be um, all different shapes and sizes. And there are currently only about 120,000 named species of fungi, but uh, it's estimated that there are up to 3.8 million species. So if you're into taxonomy, this is a good, good group to study because there are a lot of unnamed species out there. And in this group of at least the 120,000 known species, there are unique structures and there are unique forms of nutrition. There are unique ways that mushrooms do life or their lifestyle. So when we talk about a mushroom, what we're talking about is a fleshy fungi, a fungi that we can touch and hold and feel. And so the biggest um, mushroom that exists, and this gets toted on the side of this U-Haul <laughs> truck that you may have seen out in the world, um, is the armillaria. Uh, can you guys see my, sorry, I'm gonna interrupt. Can you see my Zoom control panel that I'm moving around? Mm -hmm. No, okay, it's throwing me off. I want it to go, <laughs> I don't like looking at myself talk. Okay, uh, that's better. So, sorry, just give me one second. Now I can only see Carrie and she's <laughs> which is great. <laughs> the screen looks great on our end. <laughs> okay. okay, so that's better. Uh, so you may have seen this U-Haul going around calling the, you know, the humongous fungus. And that doesn't mean that it is the most giant mushroom you've ever seen, but the entire organism itself covers over 2,000 acres and is estimated at about 2,500 years old. So when we're talking about mushrooms, we're talking about these fleshy fungi. So there's a lot of other uses for fungi though, a lot of commercial uses. We think that, you know, oh, fungi, okay, mushrooms. The only way that you're making money in, you know, the economy with mushrooms is, is food, wild mushrooms that are foraged and sold in the grocery store or produced commercially. Um, but really, there are a lot of uses of mushrooms. They are in our cheese, they are in citric acid, all of your sprites and orange crush and things like that that use citric acid. Um, fungi are used to commercially produce citric acid. It doesn't actually come from citrus anymore. Uh, so bread, wine, beer, soy sauce, kombucha, lots of pharmaceutical drugs, um, all of these things are um, used by our, our uh, sorry, have fungi involved in their use. And also, uh, you know, you may have heard of bioremediation using one type of biological organism to help uh, clean up uh, pollutants or to help with invasive species. But when we're using a fungal organism for that, we call it mycoremediation. And these can be used to like help clean up oil spills and stuff. So we're going to be talking just about the fleshy fungi, but of course we can't forget, you know, beer and wine and pizza and cheese. It's all, we have all of these things because of fungi. So I'm going to skip over that and go directly to two kinds of lifestyles that fungi have that we'll be focusing on today. So I mentioned that fungi are the great decomposers decompo and we call these types of fungi, the types of fungi that feed on dead and decaying material, we call these saprotrophs. So if you're out on a walk or if you're reading a guidebook and someone says this is a saprotrophic fungi, that means it's eating dead or decaying material. 
There can be predatory fungi and parasitic fungi. We're not going to talk about those today. I wish we were, but that's a different talk. Um, and then mutualists or mu um, fungi that are in a symbiotic relationship with another organism. And that's going to be a situation where both species are benefiting. And I'm going to go over some examples of that being lichen and mycorrhizae. So when we talk about symbiosis, it's a, again, a relationship between two different organisms where both species are benefiting. And the examples of symbiotic relationships with fungi are um, mycorrhizal, which is when we have an interaction between the roots of plants and uh, fungal cells. So the long filamentous or stringy fungal cells will uh, wrap around the um, root hairs of a vascular species and help that plant get nutrients from the ground. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, what I want to focus on on this slide is the other kind of symbiotic relationship between fungi that you might not be thinking about, and that is lichen. So every time you see a lichen out in the forest, uh, what you're looking at are a combination of algal cells, which are photosynthetic, so they're getting food from the sun. And you're seeing a fungal cell, usually two different species of, of fungi involved in this symbiosis that are gonna have their long stringy fungal cells wrapped around those algal cells. So those are providing the structure and the algal cells are providing the food. And so both species benefit. So anytime you see a lichen out in the world, know that you're seeing one species of algae and two or more species of fungi that are in interacting with each other to make that organism. So we're going to go back and talk about mycorrhizae in detail in a few minutes, but first I want to explain the parts of the mushroom so that you know which parts are involved in that um, relationship. Okay, so let's go over the life cycle of a mushroom quickly. And now we're not talking about other types of fungi, we're just talking about mushrooms here. Okay, so we'll start with the spore. The spore is the reproductive unit of the mushroom. And a single mushroom can produce millions of spores um, in order to spread them and have the best chance of those germinating and turning into a mushroom. These Ganoderma species here on the right, uh, or a conch mushroom, these shelf fungi can produce up to 1 trillion species per year. And when you're walking in the forest, sometimes you'll see these like brown powderings or these white powderings, and those are the spores that have been deposited. And these are great um, images that have actually caught the spores being released from these individuals. If you're lucky, you can see it in, in person, but you have to just catch it at the right moment. So here, that dusting I was talking about, um, here you can, can you guys see my cursor? Great. So here you can see this is a brown spored organism and it has dusted the forest floor with all of its spore deposit here. And these Ganoderma can produce 30 billion spores in a 24 hour period for up to six months in a row. So they're prolific spore producers. And then up on the top, we have a species of honey mushroom, the Armillaria, where each mushroom in this cluster can produce up to 16 billion spores. So spores are prolific and they're actually helpful in um, using, in identifying the mushroom that we have. So they come in a wide variety of colors. We have black spores, brown spores, pink, white, yellow, even green. And pink, this is a picture of a pink spore. We call it mycological pink. People are usually like, that's not pink. And it's like, yeah, it's, what, it's what we call pink. Um, you want to talk about color variation. If you get into some of these ID books and you get into the brown section, it will describe um, the browns in, I mean, you think pink is bad. It, chocolate brown, cigar brown, cinnamon brown, hazel brown. I mean, the, the browns that people have uh, described to get at the different colors of spores is, is really impressive. So these are spore prints, and this is a great way to find out the color of your spore. You can't tell that just by looking at a mushroom. You have to actually see the spore deposit. 
And so sometimes out in the forest, the mushrooms give us clues. We know that this is a white spored mushroom. We know that this is a brown spored mushroom. But if you don't know, you can make a spore print. And I'll talk uh, in a little bit about how to do that. And then you can find out the color of your mushroom. Because when you're identifying, it's frustrating at first, but once you realize that it's pretty easy to get at spore color, um, it becomes less frustrating. But a lot of guidebooks will start with spore color. So they'll be like overall shape of the mushroom and then immediately to spore color. Okay, so that's the spores. When a spore lands and germinates, what happens is it sends out these individual little strands or filamentous cells. So a filament just means it's in a long thin strand like a piece of thread. So we call these single filaments that germinate from a single spore a hypha. If you're talking about many hyphae, hy you would say use the plural, hyphae. All of these hyphae together make up what we call the mycelium. So the mycelium is really important because that is the majority of a fungal organism's biomass. And that is what is doing all of the feeding. That is what is spreading throughout the substrate, whether that be in the ground itself or on wood. So in these photos here, you can see the mycelium spreading uh, through the wood that it is growing on. So mycelium is crucial. Whoops. I'm pressing the wrong button in just a second. There we go. So mycelium is actually starting to be used in um, really new and exciting commercial uses as well. People are using it as an alternative to styrofoam or leather. So there's a lot of uh, hopeful ways to use mycelium for, um, you know, making products that are more sustainable. And I hope that that continues in the future. And the products are really beautiful. Okay, so now I want to talk about mycorrhizae. So again, we said that this is a symbiotic interaction between plants and fungi. And 90% of vascular plants use this interaction. And what I mean by use this as an interaction is a plant will send out its roots and then those hyphae, those individual strands of mycelia, will wrap around the individual roots. And while a, while a plant is rooted in place, it can't move, it may not be in the best place to get nutrients, but it can't move. So what happens is these mycelia can travel great distances. They can spread out and tap into um, mineral sources or, or even water sources that are farther away from the individual plant. And so, like I said, 90% of plants are using this interaction. And what's happening is because we said it's symbiotic, they both benefit. The plants are providing sugar. They're providing carbon that they've generated from photosynthesis to the fungus, so for food. And the fungus is providing phosphorus and nitrogen from the soil and even helping with water uptake. So these are individual roots that are surrounded by many, many strands of hyphae to create this mycorrhizal interaction. So myco meaning fungus and rhizae meaning root. So here you can see an extensive network of, of this um, fungal interaction underground. Um, and it, it, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Uh, sorry, so here you can see the extensive mycelium in conjunction with the roots of this pine sapling. So this tiny little pine sapling. And in the up close photo here, you can see the roots extend to about here. And the rest of this is the mycelial network extending far, far out, way farther than the root system of the sapling itself. And these photos are from an experiment where researchers took several pine saplings and washed the mycelial network away and then put the plants back in the ground to compare how they did to the saplings that had the mycorrhizal interaction. And most of the plants didn't survive. So this is an obligate relationship. They really need this relationship to um, do well. Okay. So mycelium, 
a lot of people think of mycelium as the root system for a fungus, but that's not the case. What's happening is the mycelium is the main part of the mushroom. Um, Margo or Carrie, are you able to handle the admitting? They keep popping up on my screen and it's distracting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm taking I, care of that, but I'm not I, sure what's going on with the current one. It, it what doesn't want to seem to let her in. Yeah, so I'm sorry I, if that's distracting. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm, I'm trying too. I'm sorry. Maybe it's because we're both trying, Carrie. Why don't you try? Okay. So the mycelium, again, is the main part of the mushroom. And like we said, each strand is a hyphae. So that is the main organism that exists underground. And what you're seeing when you see the mushroom is just the fruiting body. So let's go over it all together. We have our spores. They're gonna land in a suitable area and germinate and grow into these filamentous hyphae. Those hyphae are gonna turn into a network of mycelia. And then when the conditions are right, when it's wet enough or warm enough and the conditions are right to reproduce, the mycelial network, this underground um, organism will shoot up its fruit. So really the mushroom is just the, I use the analogy of an apple tree. So your tree is the actual organism and when it's ready to reproduce, and make a seed that's gonna be its reproductive unit, it makes that inside its fruit or its apple. So that is what the mushroom is. And that's why we call it the fruiting body. So when you pick a mushroom, you're not taking the entire organism away, you're just picking the fruit. So let's go over the parts of a mushroom that are gonna help you identify an unknown um, fleshy fungi you found out, find out in the woods. So the first part of the mushroom that we'll talk about is the cap. And that is just the top head of the mushroom. Then we have the gills and they, these, in this photo, the photo is of gills, but really this is the reproductive layer. So these could be teeth or pores. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we have the, the cap, which is called the pileus. We have the reproductive layer or the lamellae. We have the stipe or stem. A ring around the stipe, if present, is called the annulus. And a cup at the base of the stipe, if present, is called a vulva. And so the reason that I say if present is some species don't have these features. And so what happens is each mushroom will start out in a little egg. And you saw that in the previous slide here where you see this little pin head. So that's just underdeveloped immature mushroom that's going to open and become a mature mushroom. So if you were to cut this egg open, you could see that undeveloped mushroom shape forming inside. And so this entire egg covering we call the universal veil. And as this mushroom matures and breaks out of the veil, we'll have, sometimes we'll have evidence of veil remnants, so pieces of that universal veil that remain. If we have patches or scales or any sort of texturing on the top, those are remnants of that universal veil. If we have a cup or a vulva, those are also presence of that universe, uh, remnants of that universal veil. The ring itself, that's coming from a second veil. We call that the partial veil. So when the mushroom is in this little egg shape, there's a little covering over that fertile area, over that area that's going to produce the spores. And when we have a ring around the stalk, that used to be attached right here to the base of the cap. So here was your universal veil, but your partial veil was just covering that fertile layer. So when we see an annulus, that's remnants of the partial veil. So let's look at some actual photos now. So now you can kind of imagine that when this little mushroom was a tiny button in its little egg, it was encapsulated within these remnants here. And when they persist, they're called a vulva. And these can be constricted to the base. They can be um, big and shaggy. They can, the vulva itself can have identifying features on it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Scales, these are more remnants of that universal veil. 
and those can wash off in, in the rain. So it's good to make sure that you're seeing a, a large variety of mushrooms before you try to identify, because this mushroom, if these scales are an identifying feature and it was just in a rainstorm, they could have washed off. So clues to think about. Here's the annulus. I like this photo because you can really use your imagination to see where this was connected to the cap here, making that partial veil. And sometimes the stipe or the stem will have underground features as well. Like this is the redwood rooter, a really common a mushroom that's found in redwood groves. And there's not a lot that grow in pure redwood groves. So if you're in a pure redwood grove and you're finding mushrooms, check out and see if it has like a long, um, I'm gonna put tap root in quotations because it's not a root, it's just a stem, but it has this long underground stem or we call a rooting stipe. Okay, so when you get into your guidebooks, you're gonna see that there's lots of variation. And this is just an example of some of the things that you want to look for, the features that we use for identification. So not only do we have gills, but the attachment of those gills to the stem is gonna be an early identifying feature. So if the gills go back up to the cap and don't touch the stem at all, we call that free. If they attach broadly to the stipe, that's attached, but then there can be degrees of attachment. If they run down the stipe, we call it decurrent. If they cut inward and then attach to the stipe, we call it notched. So these are things to look at. Um, also just overall cap shape. Does it have an outy? Does it have an inny? Is it funnel shaped? Is it cone shaped? Um, is it flat? So that's great. And you think, oh, I've got it down. But there are a lot of variations within that. That's just the entry level. So some other things you want to look at are the position of the stalk. Is it central? Is it off center? Is it absent because it's a shelf fungi growing on a tree? Here are these um, gill attachments again and a few more um, a few more versions of cap shape. And then you can get to the texture on the cap. Is it woolly? Is it scaly? Are the scales pointy? Are they hairy? So all kinds of details to, to pay attention to. I also wanna point out that mushrooms can look very different as they age. So in these photos here, we have the same mushroom in different stages of its life. So it starts out as a little button, but by the time it's mature and has distributed its spores, it's completely turned up. And so people will walk up and think they have two different types of mushrooms, but really it's a good idea to scan around and make sure that you get a good sense for, is this a different mushroom or is this just a mushroom in a different stage of life? Most guidebooks will use the mature stage. So not the, the juvenile stage or the, you know, kind of on its way out stage, but they'll use this like main, um, pr the prime of the mushroom's life. That's when they will use uh, their descriptions. Okay, so when you go into guidebooks, something that you'll come across almost immediately is the, what we call the gross morphology or the overall shape of the mushroom. And that's gonna lead you to a certain point in the book. So in a really common guidebook here, you can just look at the overall shape. You'll say, I have a, a fungi with pores and that will take you to a specific page. Like in this guidebook here, the Aurora guidebook that I'll talk about in a moment. If you have pores, it'll take you immediately to page 488. So you can skip over all the mushrooms that have gills that are funnel shaped, that have teeth, that are club shaped and so on. So these are just some different renditions from different books and online sources that will show you the same kind of gross morphology to look for. Is it a cup fungi? Is it a coral fungi? Does it have pores? Is it a puff ball? Does it have teeth? And so I like this one here because it shows that spore bearing surface under the cap that can be very different. So here we have gills, we have a spongy layer of pores, ridges, so just kind of folds in the tissue, but not true blade-like gills or teeth. 
So that's what you can expect when you're jumping into early ID um, pages in an ID book. So really quickly, just with some actual photos of these things. Uh, these are mushrooms that have um, gills. So we call these agarics. These are true gilled mushrooms and they have those blade shaped mushrooms. Boletes, the next large group will have pores or tubes. And then there are species beyond boletus that have tubes, but they all just kind of get lumped into that bolete group. Uh, polypores or shelf fungi or conchs, those are all synonyms, have po pores like the boletes, but they are um, hard or tough. They're not spongy. Uh, we have toothed fungi that have spines instead of gills or tubes. And those are uh, really beautiful and a good place to start IDing. These are usually really easy to get to group. And then we have club or coral fungi that look like they belong in a tide pool or something. So these are the clubs over here and these are the coral. So these are just large groups that you can go to immediately when you pick up um, um, an unknown mushroom and are headed to a guidebook. We have stink horns that start out in these eggs and then develop into these really, really stinky fruiting bodies that actually use flies to disperse their spores. So they smell like feces or garbage. They're pretty nasty. The, the eggs are edible, but I, I, after smelling them in their adult form, I cannot eat them. Maybe someday I'll be brave. Um, and then chanterelles are vase-shaped mushrooms with shallow gills or, um, or folds. They're not really true gills. If you were to use your thumb to scrape right here, you could actually scrape off these folds. And so that's a, a group that the guidebooks will take you directly to. Then we have puffballs or gastromycetes. Uh, gastro comes from the root word for stomach, so just enclosed. And these have their spores, like I said, in enclosed structures, and they use humans who like to poof them or animals that like to eat them and break them open, or they'll just um, dehisce, they'll dry up and break open to release their spores. Um, and sometimes you'll have these little spore sacs that are rain dispersed. These little bird's nest fungi will wait for a raindrop to splash in there and that will splash the sack of spores out and they disperse their spores that way. And then jelly fungi, these are gonna be gelatinous. Um, they're kind of like blobby and that's another uh, easy group to go to. There's so many things on this slide I wanna tell you about, but I just don't have time. Okay, so let's talk about collecting fungi. Um, if you want to get into mushroom collection, there are a few supplies that um, you can get that will help you on your way. Um, a nice basket is really useful. Uh, I don't recommend one too big because then you're inclined to put all kinds of mushrooms in your basket and you're not gonna want to deal with them later, I promise. So uh, one or two of each specimen will do. And what I like to do is put those in a wax paper bag. And so you can find these boxes of wax sandwich bags at, at Oliver's or any, um, you know, any grocery store. And the reason I like wax bags is because a lot of these mushrooms have so much moisture that if you put them in individual paper bags, they're just gonna break right through that paper. And if you put them in a plastic bag, it's just gonna encourage them to rot quickly. So wax bags are great. And the reason that I suggest bags and not just putting them in your basket loose is because you can keep specimens separate that way and it's easier for ID. Um, I really like using a tackle box that you can find in a, a sporting goods store in the fishing section um, to keep mushrooms separate. And especially of the little dainty ones, they don't get smashed in your wax bags. Um, I also recommend a mushroom knife so that you can dig up a little bit of the soil. If you have a mushroom with a vulva, you don't want to cut that mushroom right at the base. This is the death cap right here. And if you had cut off that vulva right there, you might lose features that are necessary to identify a potentially deadly mushroom. So, well, not potent. the death cap is not potentially deadly. It's definitely deadly. But when you're identifying, you wouldn't want to leave behind a feature that could help you 
identify a potentially deadly fungi. Um, so again, you're not going to harm the overall organism by picking the mushroom. What you what would do harm is if you were to disturb the mycelia underneath the mushroom. So using a knife to pry out any of those um, underground features is helpful and just take care to not disturb the mycelia. And then you want a good guidebook and uh, some online resources, which is what we're going to talk about now. Um, so if you want to photograph your mushrooms, there's a few things that are really, really crucial. This photo in the upper right is probably the most common mushroom photo that I get sent to me. Hey, what's this mushroom? Now that you know the parts of a mushroom and how many features we use for our ID, I need to see those gills. I don't know if this has gills or spores, I mean, excuse me, or uh, pores or teeth. So if you have a shot of the cap and a shot of the underside, that is gonna help people ID your mushrooms. Um, a good thing to do is to pull one up so you don't have to disturb many and lay it upside down on its side. So here I can see that the gill attachment is pretty broad. It's not really attached to the stem. I can see the color of those gills so I can guess that it's light spored. I may not know the exact color, if it's white or pink or yellow, but I know it's light spored and that can help me go into the light spored group to make an identification. Um, any cap or stem details we're going to want photos of. So here, this photo is great because I can see that there are remnants of the veil hanging out on the cap. I can see features of the vulva. And some mushrooms will stain when they are exposed to oxygen. So boletes will often stain blue or red. So bolies should be cut in half. This mushroom was clear inside when it was first cut. And then as it's exposed to the air, it will turn blue. So not only bolies will stain though, a lot of other gilled mushrooms will stain. So what you can do is just make a little scratch right here on the cap surface and note any staining and maybe photograph that if, if possible. Um, some other things you want to get in a photo, a good photo, are going to be the substrate. So was this mushroom growing on the ground? Was it growing with um, on wood? So that's really helpful. If it's growing on wood, what kind of wood? If you can tell by what fallen trees are around, if you can identify those trees. Um, but if you can't, it's great to get a photo of the mushroom with some of the leaves of the trees around the foliage so that an expert can guess what the habitat was. Because a lot of mushrooms in those ectomycorrhizal relationships will only grow with a particular host tree. So Boletus edulis, our porcini, will grow with pines. Um, our California chanterelle will go with, grow with oak. Our northern chanterelle will grow with dug fir. And so that's something I forgot to mention earlier that I wanted to. If you go into the grocery store and you see that certain mushrooms are $23 a pound and other mushrooms are $4 a pound, mushrooms that are saprotrophs or that grow on decaying wood can be farmed commercially. We can take sawdust blocks, you can grow oysters and shiitakes in your home if you buy one of those blocks. So those are gonna be a lot less expensive. Mushrooms like chanterelles and porcinis those are growing in association with those roots and of their host tree. And so they have to be foraged and that's why they're so much more expensive. Anyway, so you always wanna get a, a sense of what substrate the mushroom was growing with. Also, um, of the texture, are there any scales? Are there any um, slimy features? A lot of mushrooms will have a really slimy cap and sometimes that dries out. But if you have debris stuck to your mushroom, you can guess that once upon a time it was probably slimy. So this is a great photo here. It shows that there are remnants of the partial veil. It shows a pore layer. It shows that the mushrooms were growing with pine. It shows that they were once sticky. So as many features as you can get into that photo is going to make that photo more usable for identification. This mushroom over here, this is the same mushroom but there's no way I'm gonna be able to identify this from this photo. So you guys get the idea. Melina, another thing, well, you've got just a minute or so left. I'm oh sorry. gosh, we go so fast. Okay, another thing that you can do is make, 
that spore print. And so a good way to do that is when you get home, you can remove the stem and put just the cap on either, um, some people use foil, some people use a mix of black and white paper because a white spore print isn't gonna show up on white paper, but it shows up nicely on black. So you remove the cap, place a bowl over the cap so that it won't be disturbed by airflow, wait about 24 hours and you should have a nice spore print showing you the exact spore color um, in the morning if you need that. Okay, so online resources. Um, some websites that I really like are Myco Web, and I'll show you how to navigate to the California fungi in a moment. If you go to the main page for Myco Web, and that's Myco with a K, and navigate over to California fungi, you'll get this page here, and it will it can give you a species index where you can look up the name of any species and get photos of that mushroom in California, which is really useful because a lot of times if you Google image search, you'll get a mushroom from another state or you know you can't be sure that it's the species that you're you're looking for and i also really like mushroomexpert.com and it has a great link to identifying trees which can be crucial for mushroom id as well so when i'm using online sources to try and find the name of my mushroom i go to myco web and then if i can't find it there i go to mushroom expert but then what we really wanted to talk about today and we're running out of time is iNaturalist so iNaturalist is a really great tool for involving yourself in citizen science and getting out there and making observations. And, and this is such a powerful tool because the experts, we can't be everywhere. And so citizen science is so great because it allows citizens like you to go out, make observations. And then since you guys are covering so much more ground, we can come in and make suggestions for ID and then other experts can come in and confirm those identifications, making them research grade. And then we can pull spreadsheets, we can select a certain area and say, I wanna know all of the fungi that we're growing in this general area, in this general season to see how diversity is changing over time with changing weather patterns or climate change. So it's a really powerful tool and we can't we can't do it without the contributions of citizens. So I'm gonna go in one minute, if, if I have time, I'm gonna go and show you how to upload things to iNaturalist. You did get that great tutorial um, that Margo sent out. And maybe since we're running short on time, um, what we'll do is we'll answer questions. And then if anybody wants to stick around and see a tutorial on how to upload things, I can show you that. Um, and then the last thing, um, that'll work? Yeah. Great. And then the last thing I want to point out are the books that I like for this area. Um, All the Rain Promises and More. Um, this is a book by David Aurora. It's a great beginner guide. The only trouble with this book is it's really small. And so, I mean, that's good if you want to put it in your pocket. But if you go to his other book, it has over 2000 species. This book can only, you know, cover so many. So you get to a mushroom and you find the picture that matches it best and you think that's what you have and that's a great place to start, but it could be one of many other things that looks very similar. Mushrooms Demystified is probably the best key for unknown mushrooms. If you're really serious and you want to get into keying unknowns, Mushrooms Demystified maintains with the best keys. It's You're going to have the most success finding an unknown mushroom in this book, but it's old now, it's a little outdated. So what I do is I cross-reference with some of the newer books on the market that have updated names. So some of the names in, in Demystified are a little bit old. I really love Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. It's got great photos, you. it's got great photos and great descriptions. It does not have keys. So you're using picture ID. But because the pictures are so detailed and the descriptions are so detailed, it works. And it's set up in a really um, intuitive way to go through the groups of mushrooms. California mushrooms has keys that are simpler than demystified, but they're not as comprehensive. Um, but I like to use this as a way to cross-check. It also has good photos. 
And then Mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest is a great book if you're heading into like the Humboldt or Northern regions. Um, and it also has really nice photos. So those are the books that I like the most. And I'm gonna stop there because I don't have time to go over what we're seeing in the forest right now. So um, I'm gonna stop my share. We'll address some questions. And then I have the iNaturalist website pulled up. So if anybody's having trouble um, navigating that site, I'm happy to give a little. Well, we have a few minutes. We have a few minutes left, Melina, and there were a couple of questions in the chat, which I would like to uh, put forward to you because they've come up during your presentation. When you were talking about the oxidizing mushrooms, Great. Uh, Jenna asks, would a video yeah. of cutting it be better to post than a still photograph? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you if you can do that, um, yes, video is always great. I'm not sure if iNaturalist lets you upload video. That's a good question. Let's find out. It may only let you upload um, still photos. But if you're, no, does I think it let it does you allow. upload audio? Oh, you can? Great. I know that I've uploaded audio for like insect noises, but I don't know about video. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm guessing it probably does. I haven't seen a lot of videos, but I have seen videos of the bluing and it's, it's, it's great because some will blue faster than others. And so like there's a really common species of agaricus that grows on lawns right now. And people are sending it to me just all the time. And let's see, do I have that photo? Um, one of them will ye yellow very slowly. Here, I'm gonna share my screen again just for a minute, okay? Uh, so this species of mushroom here, uh, can you guys see my entire screen or just the, there we go. That's good. Uh, there we go. So this is really common on lawns right now. And you can see over here that if you scratch the cap and it turns yellow really, really fast, that's called agaricus xanthodermis. Xantho means yellow in Latin derma skin. So agaricus with the yellow skin. But there's also Agaricus californicus, which looks almost identical other than slightly darker center. And this one will yellow really slowly when you scratch it. So that's the way I tell those two species apart. Okay. Great question. Um, another question is, Uh, one of them says that I've seen one of those growing mushroom kits before. Why yes. does the instruction say to cover it in a provided plastic bag when you were suggesting wax bags? Ah, so that's a little different. So when you're growing from a mushroom kit, you want to maintain a certain level of moisture and the plastic is going to allow for that. When you're collecting mushrooms and putting them in your basket, a really wet mushroom is just going to turn to slime by the time you get home to identify it. So the Good. wax kind of helps. I think that's, that helps. Yeah. Um, Ian time. says earlier in the lecture, you said that certain fungi help draw nutrients for plants. Are there specific fungi that you could put in your garden to help your plants grow better? So if you wanted to inoculate a specific tree with mycelium, you could attempt that, um, but they kind of figure out this interaction on their own. Yeah, for the most part. So I know that a lot of people have tried not necessarily to help plants in their garden grow better, but to get the mushrooms that they want to eat to grow with a tree that they have in their yard. And it's, it's not um, something that you can do with easy, uh, the, people don't have a lot of success. If they did, we would have pine farms and we'd be farming porcini for sure. So um, That's good. they kind of, they kind of, figure, they figured it out on their own for the most part. So they're doing it. Juliet asks, redwoods don't necessarily have a deep root system. Is a mycelium network a part of their water uptake? 
No, most of the research I've heard about redwoods, because there is a lot of questions about the redwood water uptake, is that they are getting a lot of their moisture from the fog. So uh, this is a different subject, but um, if you're really interested in redwood and water uptake, you can look up the work of a fellow named Todd Dawson out of UC Berkeley, and he has shown why redwoods grow, where they grow, and a lot of their moisture is coming from um, the fog belt and why they grow in that zone and not anywhere else. So I don't know the question, the specific answer to that regarding mycelia, they do have mycorrhizal interactions, but there aren't a ton of mushrooms that you find growing specifically with redwoods. So I think it's more opportunistic than obligate. Okay. Um, one I'm not quite understanding, Hale says the yellow stainer the question mark? Yes. Yeah, that's the agaricus xanthodermis. I'm okay. not sure. I guess that's what Hale yeah. wanted to know is what that was again. Okay. Really common on lawns right now. It looks like your typical grocery store mushroom, your little pizza mushroom, um, but it's not edible. That's not the one. They're different. Our, your pizza mushroom won't stain yellow. Okay. All right, good. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give us a wrap up here. And then if people want to stay around, Melina's going to hang out here on Zoom and will help us with INAT or other questions that you didn't have a chance to get to get answered. And then maybe can we hear about what's growing right now? Sure. Why yeah. We, why don't we do that afterwards, Carrie? Yeah. You don't mind. Yeah. Uh, After that, we do need to mm -hmm. we need, do need to wrap up. But thank you, Melina. You really, I just think there was so much to that and it's so hard to do in the length of time. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, year's course you tried to, or more, you tried to condense. Pretty it. much. I, I mean, it was killing me to not tell you like 50% sure. sure. more things on every slide. <laughs> so. Well, one of the things I'm really excited to tell you all is that there is a chance for some of you, a few of you to put these skills to use on December 4th for our mushroom blitz on the Osborne Preserve in Sonoma Mountain in Roner Park. If you are interested, please email me at rollinsm at sonoma.edu for more information. We're gonna take, I'm gonna take this on a um, first come first serve basis. I put my email in the chat and you all should have that also from uh, various emails that I have, I have sent out to you. Um, as I mentioned before, this is one of 17 virtual events being offered, there are the full listing you can find at cei.cinema.edu slash calendar. But the ones that are coming up right away are both in a series called Building Resilience. And they, the series showcases a broad coalition of organizations working together to address sustainability in Sonoma County. On December 8th, we will learn about disaster support for vulnerable populations. And January 12th will be the last one of our fall events. And that one, we're going to look at greening, heat, and urban trees. So thank you all for attending. I really appreciate Melina's great presentations. And stay safe, and we hope to see you all again soon.